Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate very much your generous invitation to be here tonight. You bear heavy responsibilities these days. Welcome to Stock Legends Radio Show, seeking answers, opinions, and the inside scoop, putting you in the front seat on Wall Street. In today's market, this is breaking news. Where is it going next? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stock Legends Radio Show. Please welcome today's host, myself, Quick Draw. Also, today we have a special guest that we've known for quite a long time. Um, he's currently operating in the electric vehicle market. His company's name is EMAV Holdings, trading under OTCQB, ticker symbol EMAV. Today we have uh, the CEO, Keith Rosenbaum, on the radio show. Keith, welcome to the Stock Legends Radio Show. Justin, always good to talk with you. Thanks so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Now, Keith, for the listeners that may not be familiar with yourself and your background, why don't you take a brief moment and tell us a little bit about your history and what your mission is uh, with EMAV Holdings. I appreciate that. I feel like I always have to uh, apologize when we're doing the quick little intro. By trade, I'm, I'm an attorney. And when uh, people always ask, what kind of attorney are you? My dumb answer is, I'm a good one. But I, I, I like to kind of follow that up and say, I'm... I'm one of the good guys. I'm a corporate tax and securities attorney. I'm, I'm not a court guy. I don't you know, chase after ambulances or sue people, anything like that. Been doing it for over 30 years. Uh, sit on the board of, uh, of a number of my clients, act as a member of the management team, and get, get very much involved with, uh, with the business side of things of my clients. I've got a, uh, a finance and, and accounting background, worked on Wall Street for, uh, for a couple of years, which seems like a, a million years ago. And in, in the past, also there is a law enforcement background as well. So kind of a uh, you know kind of, kind of got around through, through the years. A nice mixed bunch there, but very prepared for what lies ahead in the future. So so tell us a little bit specifically about this electric vehicle market. Everyone's familiar with it, and uh, it's been the craze now for for quite a few years. What's your mission statement and your goals for this company in particular? Goal for the company really is that we're. Uh, we're looking to get into this side of the market, kind of following the path that's been blazed by, uh, by Tesla and, and a lot of the other companies, learning from their mistakes, taking the, uh, the, the good parts as well, and really focusing on taking what is popular, what consumer public and the commercial public wants, not trying to, to force something upon them, give them exactly what they want in, in an all-electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle and really what we call a, a low-volume manufacturing approach, not trying to be everything to everybody, keeping things simple, keeping our, our capital expendi- expenditures down to a minimum, and really looking at uh, selling 800 vehicles in order to be profitable and rewarding our, our investors with a real nice return. There's been a big craze about the electric vehicle market in particular. Just to quote a source here from the United States uh, website, whitehouse.gov, they just released a report here recently. It was actually released about two months ago on whitehouse.gov. And the United States government said that by 2025, their emissions targets their quota is that our vehicle emissions will produce 28% below the emissions from the 2005 vehicle emission levels. Now, what does that say for the future of this particular segment and for the future of your company? For us, that, that, that's a wonderful thing because what we're, what we're looking at doing is we have, we're looking at doing commercial vehicles and consumer vehicles. On the consumer side, you know, we, we, we get a lot of comments that, well, gas is cheap right now and Gas is going to continue to be cheap into the near future, and that's a great thing. I'm, I'm a big, big patriot. I love my country. You know, I'm, I'm excited that we're not as dependent upon you know, importing oil anymore. The whole boom up in North Dakota, I think, is going to come back again also. I'd like to see gas prices stay as low for as long as possible. It, it's, it's great for our country. And, and with that said, people will say, well, then who's going to buy an electric vehicle? Well, you, you got to remember that the people that are spending $120,000 on a, on a Tesla, there's a new, a new company out there called uh, Dubuque, which is out of Canada. They're talking about having a $120,000 offering. You know, for us also, on, on the consumer side, for people that are looking to buy a, a premium, really upscale Jeep Wrangler or, or F-150 that's an all-electric vehicle, 
They're going to spend ninety, ninety-five thousand dollars on that. They don't care about the price of gas, Justin. They're going to buy our vehicle because they can afford to, because they want it, and because, quite frankly, it's the right thing to do to conserve and to still reduce emissions. Now, on the on the commercial side, which is really getting to your to your question, it's even better for us because the so-called cafe standards, which are the which are the fuel efficiency standards and the the emission standards, this is mandated. The U.S. government is saying. Utilities, large utilities, large commercial fleets, governments and, uh, and municipalities, all of these are, are, are mandated. They're required to reduce their emissions and, and to, to, to increase their mileage. So it doesn't matter about the price of gas. So again, going directly to your question, if the government is saying all of you large commercial users, you must reduce your emissions, that's great news for us. Because, again, it doesn't matter what the price of gas is. They cannot keep pumping gas in, into their vehicles because that's not going to reduce emissions. Electric vehicles, what we're talking about doing, obviously, plug-in hybrids, that's the only thing that's going to reduce emissions. So it's great news for us. Many people might think that electric vehicle sales are down because of the gas prices. And, again, there's a much larger, grander scale. Anybody that watches the oil and gas market knows that OPEC is playing a significant role and trying to deleverage the U.S.'s shale production coming out of the Eagle Ford. For a while there, to produce shale and these other forms of gas, the extraction process was actually more expensive than the cost per barrel at the going rate at the time of the technology. But what happened is there was a big transition in the market, and the United States had a significant technological advancement and was able to produce oil for less than the price to pump it out of the ground, which, which forced Saudi Arabia and OPEC as a whole to overproduce oil and flood the market in order to meet their their quotas. But to bring back to my basic statement, Bloomberg just put out another article which was, which was published December 2015, which, which stated that despite the lower gas prices, the electric vehicle market sales have actually grown 290% year on year to 171,000 vehicles. And they're expected to reach 250,000 vehicles this year, which is far from a drought on the electric vehicle market. So despite the the current market conditions, electric vehicle sales and production have skyrocketed. I mean, 290% is a parabolic raise in sales, and it's been able to be held consistently. The title of this this article here with Bloomberg, just to source it, is called To See the Future of Electric Cars. Look east if anybody wants to look it up. So, I mean, despite the, the gas and oil crunch, sales are, are through the roof. So we're not seeing any slowdown in the production or sales market in the electric vehicles. And The Guardian also published an article on February 25th titled Electric Vehicles Will Be Cheaper Than Conventional Vehicles by 2022 that states that purchasing an electric vehicle will cost significantly less than a standard vehicle due to the internal combustion engines and battery technology, which is huge. I mean, that shows the longevity of the industry alone. Absolutely. You know, let me go back for a second, because right now you're really talking more about consumer vehicles than you are commercial vehicles. And th- think about this. The, the consumer public, they, they want a, re- a, a reliable vehicle. They want something that, that they know is going to work when they go out in the morning, whether it's 10 degrees below zero or, or 105 degrees out in Palm Springs, California, that the vehicle is going to gonna turn on, the engine is going to start, it's going to work. And whether gas is at Two bucks a gallon or four fifty a gallon. People don't. People like enjoy driving by the gas station. They, they, you know, people just don't enjoy going in there and filling up the tank. Here's the thing: we've gone through a, a real vetting process. We've gone through a vetting process where so many of the, the EVs, the, the, the consumer electric vehicles that were out there, were these. I, I'll, I'll watch my language here. Were these just ridiculously designed? and shaped vehicles. It was like, if it's going to be an EV, it's got to be something that the Jetsons were driving. It's got to be some space-looking, weird-looking vehicle. Got to be small. It's got to have smaller tires. Listen, I'm, I'm a hockey guy. I still play hockey. I've got, I've got four kids, three boys. They, all three of them play hockey. My daughter, is a, she's a, a big hockey fan. You know, we go to play hockey. I'm sorry. I'm not going to fit a couple of hockey bags in a Prius or an Aptera or a Coda, you know, some of these vehicles that have gone by the wayside. So when I talk about a vetting process, you're finally at the point where 
the companies are producing electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids that people want to drive. They look like normal vehicles. You know, it's something that people are, are okay with driving. That's number one. Number two, like I said, people like driving by the gas station, no matter, no matter what the cost is, and not having to fill up. It's, it's, it's a fun thing to do, you know, knowing that you're going to go five, 600 miles. Also, whether you're in a Tesla or think about this, our vehicles, you're in an, F, in an F-150 or you're in a Jeep Wrangler, you're going zero to 60 in three seconds. That's a kick in the pants. That's something that's going to that's gonna trump price of gas and a lot of other things. You're not doing oil changes. The cost of maintenance is significantly less because you've got an electric engine and a drivetrain. You've got less moving parts. You have less things to go wrong. All these things are now are big benefits that when, when you add all those things up, people are not just looking at, okay, gas is two bucks a gallon. There's no reason for me to buy an EV. There's a huge reason for you to still buy an EV, and there's more choices that are out there now also. So, yeah, you, you, you're right. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to get a little excited about this, but this is my, this is my passion. This is my business, and this is why I see, I see great things happening for EMAV. You know, the other thing is, uh, again, on, our, on the consumer side of things, you can't buy. You can buy a, a real nice premium F-150. They've got the, the, the Lariat version. You've got other companies that are doing upgrades. You can buy an upgraded Jeep Wrangler, Rubicon, and there are some companies that, that, that do the nice upfits. But think about getting all those premium aspects and that great drive and then add to that an electric engine or a plug-in hybrid engine to go with that. It's, it's a winner. People are going to buy that. I can't agree with you more. And hear, hearing your excitement, you know, builds a lot of confidence. We, you know, we love to hear you excited, and, and it's a very exciting market. Now, let's talk specifically about your internal process because there's a few different aspects of the company, and we want to loop them together so that they all make a lot of sense. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about your acquisition strategy and how this is going to play a direct role in bringing cars to market. Oh, and great, great question. The best way to look at our company, Justin, is we've, we've got three separate independent lines of businesses. You know, I, I know the cool word to use is, is three silos. I'm, I'm still not exactly sure what that means, but we've got three silos, three separate lines of businesses that each one is, is a standalone, profitable part of the business, but all three support each other. So number one, we, we've got the, the auto dealership business, and as you mentioned, that that's that's where we're hot and heavy on the acquisition side of things. We're getting ready to announce our, our first acquisition. We're getting ready to, to execute a letter of intent to acquire a small Ford dealership. Shortly after that, we'll be acquiring a, a, a Jeep dealership. And, and then there's two more uh, dealerships after that. And it, it all comes into, this is a hot market. We're, we're acquiring smaller auto dealerships, that, again, that are profitable, you know, basically one-offs. So it's not it's not the the ten unit mega store that Berkshire Hathaway might look to purchase or some of these other other large acquisition groups that are out there that are that are that are in the, the dealership acquisition business and we acquire those number one to make to make money but number two when we get an order for either a, let's say for for the Ford vehicle for the F one fifty we're not going to another Ford dealership then and paying that dealer. His profit or his increased cost, we're acquiring the what we call the platform vehicle at cost because it's through our, our own dealership. Again, we're making money at, at the dealership level. We have we have people attached with us with the expertise to run these dealerships, and it, it, it lowers our, our 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 cost, increases our profit margin. So that the second silo that we have, the second business that we have, is the assembly business. We have. And it, we'll have an assembly facility that we're currently building out. We have a 25-year veteran of Mopar, which is the parts division of, of Chrysler, that's leading that up for us. We've worked with this gentleman before on, on assembling our own F-150 fully electric vehicle. We've worked with this gentleman through our, our other contacts. We've assembled uh, Jeep Wranglers for the UN that are being used in Haiti. We have extensive assembly experience. So that assembly business... Is again the that's a low volume manufacturer. We're doing assembly work 
and we've already lined up for, uh, for other businesses and other companies. So again, always looking at the bottom line, always got to be profitable. And it's assembling our own business, our, our own vehicles, which then ties in with the third silo, the third prong of our business, and that's the sale of the electric vehicles itself. itself. So each, each, each separate division is its own standalone profitable business, but as I, as I mentioned, it supports uh, each other. It's a, it's, a, it's a unique way of doing it, and again, it, it, as part of that process, you've got the consumer side and the commercial side. No one else, Justin, in the industry is doing that. We're, we're, we're selling commercial vehicles, again, plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles, to utilities, water districts, municipalities, government entities, and commercial fleets that are mandated. They have to buy our vehicles. We love that. And then on the consumer side, we're, uh, we're selling our vehicles that will be directly through dealerships. And that, that, that's, again, that's very different as opposed to Tesla, which is, which is really battling the, uh, the dealership model. We don't want to do that. We're embracing the dealership model. That's, I, I think that's kind of the, the American way, so to speak, and, and how things are done. And we'll sell our vehicles directly through Jeep dealerships and directly through Ford dealerships and also through our own dealerships, which is very important because that also gives us the ability to sell off of the, uh, off of the Internet. Again, all, all, all three aspects of our business all supporting each other. Yeah, that, that three-point strategy has a perfect synergy because if you think about it, you utilize the dealership to go direct to Ford and get at-cost pricing. You're able to use that particular system to, to create the electric vehicle component. You service it at that dealership. Now, the warranty is still in effect through Ford for the components that are not the standard electric components. So you're able to cut the cost. You're able to still make money on the servicing. And then you're able to go ahead and assemble the electric components in-house. So you're saving yourself from a middleman then. And then you're able to turn around with a significantly reduced cost and put that vehicle directly to market through your own sales avenues. It, it makes perfect sense. You got it. You, you, you nailed it right there. Exactly right. And again, low, low, you know, low volume manufacturer, we're talking about a threshold of maybe 800 vehicles that we need to sell a year to be, uh, to be profitable. We think that we're going to sell a heck of a lot more than that. And it's, it's, it's also a, a concept that we almost... Uh, to a certain degree, like into the old old Dell computer laptop map model in terms of build, build, build to order. We, uh, we don't believe in inventory. <laughs> we, we don't want to keep a lot of uh, inventory around, and, and that also suits us just fine. We're going to go out there and, and sell, and if we go out to a, uh, a utility in Northern California, and they want a big, they want a big car, a you know, big vehicle. They want a Ford F-250, let's say, and they want all the utility boxes and, and storage use that's attached to that. They want to put a, a cherry picker, you know, those little um, <clears throat> baskets that, that'll go up to fix the, uh, fix the utility lines. We can do that. We have the ability to, to assemble it and produce that for them. And again, as a, as a plug-in hybrid vehicle. Or if they come to us and they say, all we want is, is the, the truck as a, as a plug-in hybrid and then we'll take it the rest of the way. We'll put everything else on it. We'll put the cherry picker on it. That's fine. I mean, and, and again, that, that really is the, the beauty of it in terms of it's built to order. We're not, we're not, in, the, we're not in, the, in the push business. We're not going to build a bunch of vehicles and then try and push that on the, uh, into, into the market. It's, it's really a function of, and we've done this already. We've gone out and we've done our homework. We've talked to... A lot of utilities that are out there. We've talked to a, lo a lot of these mandated uh, fleets, and we've talked to them and asked them what they want, and that's why we're uh, that's why we're focusing on the F one hundred and fifty and the Jeep Wrangler. Yeah, and, and a build to order concept makes sense because it, it keeps costs low. You still have a fast turnaround, and a lot of these vehicles are going to be customized to a certain extent. Now, we spoke about something very unique earlier, prior to recording the show, and we spoke about some of these very specific type of vehicles. And we were talking about the cost of these electric vehicles. We were stating that, you know, some of the costs, especially for some of these government type of needs, can 
go into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why don't you talk about the capabilities of some of these vehicles and the limitations? If not, maybe I should rephrase and say the limitless limitations and <laughs> speak a little bit about that specifically. It's a very, very cool segment. No, and, and, and I, 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 again, I'll try not to get too, uh, <laughs> too excited or too, too animated here. It's like one of our product offerings, it, it's called the Power Station. And, uh, and you, you were, you were kind of laughing about that earlier because you were saying, well, you know, it sounds like a rolling generator. And that's kind of exactly what it is. There, there's a big term that's used in, in the industry, and it, it's called onboard generation of exportable power. And, and, and if you think about that for a second, onboard generation, where the vehicle itself is, is, is generating, uh, generating power, and again, of exportable power, so you're able to to use that for, for other things. What, what comes to the mind of most people are these tow-behind diesel generators. And, and, and you've seen them. Cummings, Caterpillar, they're, they're out there where you've, you've got the work truck towing this mobile generator behind it. You get out to the work site, you fire that thing up, it's diesel powered, it's very loud, very annoying, emits diesel fumes, goes for maybe eight hours, and, and it's done. Well, our product, one of our signature products is, imagine a, a disaster situation, whether it's an earthquake or, let's say, Super, you know, Superstorm Sandy that hit a couple of years ago. Instead of rolling out this diesel generator out there, you can drive it out to that, to that disaster scene with this Jeep Wrangler. And the Jeep Wrangler then, it, un, un, it has drawers and pockets on the side, different, different arrays, that, that, again, that are right there, that Jeep Wrangler is a rolling generator, like, like, you, like you called it before. And, again, that's why we call it the power station. It gets out there. It is a, its own generating system. So since it's electric, it puts out more power, lasts longer. It's completely silent. Yeah, there's some great military applications here also. And puts out... Zero exhaust, no emissions whatsoever. If we had this available when, 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 when Superstorm Sandy hit, we would have been able to roll this out, and it would have been able to, to light up 250 houses for maybe three days. I mean, and, and just think about that, that you know, the, the incredible advantage that that would have. Also, you know, again, any type, of, any type of relief scenario, any type of disaster scenario, you drive that out there, and, and uh, again, I know you've got a military background. I've got a law enforcement background. I've talked to a number of my buddies who are, who are chiefs of police now, actively involved in homeland security issues, things of that nature. Got a lot of input from them as well. So when, when you drive this out to, 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 to the response scene, again, it's silent, which is great, putting out all this power, the ability for everybody to plug in their devices, ability to generate power to power up, whether it's houses or to, to generate, uh, if power goes down in the area, you're able to provide power to uh, utility crews to get things going again, and you've got the ability to a Wi-Fi hotspot that does 250, 250 devices at the same time. I mean, it's, it's, we, we, we're excited to get that out there. When you asked, you asked me at the beginning about, you know, the mission of the company. You know, I'm, I'm the CEO of the company. I, I, I have brought in, we have about 300 stockholders. I'm personally responsible for, for bringing in probably 240 of those 300 stockholders. They're my friends. They're my contacts. They're people that I've been introduced to. So I, I, I feel a real obligation, obviously, to, to, to return a profit to them and to, uh, to make their investment worthwhile. Which, which, we're, which we're doing, and, and we will do. Yet at the same time, I, I love thinking about, about this product because there's that old expression, you can do well by doing good. This is something that, that is, it, it, it does good. It really does, Justin. It, 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 it helps the first responders. It helps our law enforcement community. It, it's, we're going to go into a disaster situation, and we're going to help people. Yeah, I mean, again, we're going to make a profit off of selling these things. We're not going to give these things away. Yet at the same time, I know that when I'm, I'm going to be watching the news at night, and I'm going to be seeing our EMAP vehicles that are out there helping people and, and, and making a difference. 
that's that's a great thing that gets me really excited. That is without a doubt. <clears throat> this one particular vehicle has the ability to single-handedly control chaos. You have to understand that when these natural disasters strike, you know, the first responders, the element of communication, electricity alone has the ability to control chaos. Chaos ensues when people do not have the ability to reach for help, when uh, electricity is out, when alarm systems are down, when first responders lack intelligence capabilities, when they cannot communicate with each other. Things get out of hand. The streets get overrun very quickly by gang activity. You know, we saw this in in New Orleans. And, and, you know, common everyday citizens become victims. It's a sad thing to watch. This particular system right here single-handedly could have controlled chaos in a lot of the catastrophes that we've seen. And this is a no-joke kind of system. Just so people really understand the capabilities here, we're talking about 300 kilowatts of stored energy that has the ability to create 220 to 440 volts of AC current, five portable chargers, 10 110 volt AC connections, up to four connections from 12 to 96 volts. So this is like a single-handed, literal machine that could turn on multiple blocks of power. I mean, uh, the solar it also has solar cell power arrays that deliver eight kilowatts of continuous power in a closed loop gas-powered regeneration system. So this is a big deal. I mean, this is this is a very unique. Uh, in very needed component to any operation. I can't. I mean, you, you uh, not, not to go on and on, but you, that you're you're exactly right, and that's also you you get it, and and that's also why we're we're so excited about it. The the industry seems to get it also, and uh, we're we're excited about bringing it to market as quickly as possible. This is a very exciting time for for you and your company. I mean, what do you see transpiring over the next uh, six to twelve months? I know that this is a ground level opportunity for investors. It's not often that you have the opportunity to get in at the ground level with a company like this. Very new company, just hit the market. You've got some uh, industry veterans in positions to be able to take leadership roles and grab the bull by the horns. What do you see over the next tw- six to twelve months transpiring? And I, and I know that's a very cliche question i'm just saying you know as far as your your hit list and projected strategy no no and and, and it's a fair question i think it goes back to all that, that three-point strategy that we talked about and listen it's one of the things i look at is is for for a while we, we've been what i what i'll call an opportunity and we're still a, a, a great opportunity. It's an investment opportunity. Again, we'll just, just use that term. But now we've transitioned. We're not just about being an opportunity anymore. Now it's about execution. And that's all we've asked for. We, we, we've been, when I say we, our management team, ha, have been very patient putting, putting this whole plan together to get to this point now where, okay, guys and ladies, it's no longer about just being an opportunity. Now it's about execution. Let's get this. Let's get this darn thing done, and that's what the next six to twelve months is really about. It's about execution. It's about closing on these on these dealership acquisitions. Again, we got we'll, we'll sign the first LOI probably next week. Get get that deal closed. I'm going to say maybe in sixty days, and then get get two more done immediately after that. So it's about executing on acquiring these 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 dealerships. Then it's about executing, finishing getting our, our assembly facility up and running, getting, the, getting, that, getting that ready, and getting in our first orders. And then it's about executing on, on those orders. We have, we have things in place. Listen, pe- people are not going to buy, buy something on, on, on a hope, and we know that. So part of the money that we're, that we're raising right now goes, goes not, into, not, more, not more R&D, you know, we're not a biotech company. We're not trying to develop a new drug. We're not trying to develop an app. This is about bringing the product to market, about sales, about making money. That's what people want, and that's what we want to do. So the money that comes in goes towards producing five sales models, and we take those sales models, and we go back to the people we've already talked to that have said, show us a sales model, and we'll place orders. So it's about getting those initial sales models done and about 
like getting orders. Justin, my 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 goal, my obligation to this company is to start taking orders by this summer. We get orders in by the summer, and we start filling those orders, and we're we're making the money come come third and fourth quarter of this year. That's what it's all about. And then you said the so twelve months again. I can't I can't promise, but the objective is a year from now is we uplist. We're not going to stay on the uh, OTC QB is great. Don't get me wrong, and it's where we need to be right now. We'll never be a pink sheet company. I, I you know we, we won't we won't downgrade like that. But we're going to Nasdaq or NYSE. That's the plan. And, and, and my, my goal is to be there a year from now. That's a very aggressive strategy. Also, utilizing these acquisitions, you'll be rolling in revenue opportunities just off of the dealerships alone prior to the electric vehicle component. So it's going to have a much faster change of gears due to the multifaceted strategy that you've put into place. And also, just a note, you've recently closed, it said in one of your press releases, a very large financing. So it's not like you are not financed. How do you think this access to millions of dollars of future cash is going to help you propel the company into the right direction? You know, you, you, you do a great job <laughs> as the moderator, Justin. I'm, I, I get all excited talking about the company and talking about the product and, and what we're going to do. And uh, thanks for kind of bringing me back on point. Great, great company called Southridge Capital. We, uh, we, we did a deal with them where they, uh, they've committed an uh, equity investment into the company of $5 million. It, it's, it's not a, a one-shot deal. It's uh, you know, going to be over, over a short period of time. It's uh, an equity purchase agreement, so not debt, which uh, we're trying to stay away from as much as possible. And, and you're right, though that that's gonna that's, that's a huge benefit to us. It shows that there that there is some some real institutional interest in our company. This is not just a, a mom and pop shop. This is a, a very well established uh, you know public equity company, private equity company out of out of Connecticut that that believes in us and put their trust and confidence in with us, and like I said, they've committed $5 million, which, uh, which we'll be accessing. That will, that will help us with some of our acquisition plans, and also will uh, we'll help to provide additional working capital as we move forward. You've always got to follow the smart money as a small-time investor. It seems like time is of the essence. It looks like a great market. Even the, the own U.S. government is projecting the basic parabolic breakout of this industry in particular. It's in its infancy stages, not just the company, but the industry as a whole. You've got the funding in place. You have a very unique strategy that allows you to maintain complete control of the process from start to finish at the lowest cost possible. And as a fill-by-order strategy, you're able to keep your overheads low and keep your capabilities customizable based on those orders. It, it makes a lot of sense, Keith. It has to be a very exciting time for, for you and the company right now putting all the pieces into play. It really is. And as I, I said before, we're, we're no longer just an opportunity. Now, now it's about execution. And, uh, and we're excited to finally be at that point. Keith, for the investors that are listening today, you know, we all, get all kinds, the kinds of different investors that listen. You know, there might be investors that are interested in getting in at the ground level out of the open market. There might be investors that are interested in, in putting in some private money into the company if that's an opportunity. What would you like to say to the new investors coming on or maybe to some of these larger scale investors that would like to make direct investments? What's the best way for them to contact you or, or maybe you just like to welcome them on board? I'd love to welcome them on board. Um, I'm, I'm always available to, uh, to talk with people. Uh, you know, best way is probably to uh, initiate contact with me via email, which is, which is Keith, K-E-I-T-H, at emavco. And uh, I'll spell it phonetically. E is an echo, M is in Mike, A is an alpha, V is in Victor, C is in Charlie, O is an Oscar, dot com. Keith at emavco dot com. Introduce yourself, you know, send me your phone number or say you want to chat. I'll uh, be happy to, to, you know, to talk with, with anybody <laughs> pretty much at, at any time. And I'm, I'm based right now uh, for short term in Southern California. I'm a, I'm a Brooklyn boy. Uh, I'm sure uh, the, the East Coast is, uh, is in my, my, my future. Uh, Got to head back there. But uh, probably short term, I'll be uh, 
spending a lot of time in Michigan uh, with the assembly facility and just wherever I got to go to make sure the company works. That's that's where I'll be. And uh, if any any investor is really that interested and that significant, be happy to uh, sit down and meet with interested investors as well. That's a huge point, Keith. You've always been a shaker and mover. I've watched you for years. I've always been a strong believer to bet in the jockey and not the horse specifically. <laughs> and uh, I'd put my money on you any day, Keith. It's been excited to watch you piece this together. And you've got some great times ahead of you. I'm very confident in your strategy and your philosophies. Now, for, for the investors listening today, again, one more time, this is a company currently trading on the OTCQB exchange under ticker symbol EMAV. For investors interested in grabbing a little bit more information, uh, Keith did mention the email here just a moment ago, but the website is also emavco.com. That's emavco.com, where there's all kinds of additional information on there for you to take a look at. Keith, it's always been our pleasure having you on the radio show, and, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak directly with your investors. I think it's such a valuable point, and you can always tell companies that are, are going to be successful when the CEO of the company is so interested in keeping an open line of communication with the investors. It really gives the investors the confidence they need to invest in your company. So thank you so much for coming on the radio show today. Thank you, Justin. It's uh, proud to have you as a friend, and always great working with you. really appreciate everything you do.